Hello everyone, today I want to make a follow-up video on California's recall election that just happened yesterday where Gavin Newsom didn't lose his job, he won the election and he will continue to be California's governor for the remaining time of his office. But specifically I want to talk about a lesson that everyone, no matter what your political views are, a lesson that we can learn from the speech, the concession speech that Larry Elder gave last night. I was thinking that since politics is a part of a Christian's life, and not just a follower of Jesus, but anyone really, but specifically, if you are a follower of Jesus, politics, elections are just going to be a part of your life. And I think that our Christian worldview impacts every area of our life, including when politics are happening. And you know, politics are an everyday thing, more so for some people than others. And, you know, the people that we listen to, they impact us so much. They impact the way that we communicate with others. They impact the way we think about others. So I was thinking about making a few videos on politics and maybe some lessons that no matter what your political view is, we can all learn that are going to be based on the Christian worldview. And if you are not a Christian, it doesn't mean that you're not doing some of these things already in your life or that you can't do some of these things in your life. Even if you are a Christian, you might not be doing these things in your life. So it's really just, let's have a conversation about what our Christian worldview tells us we should be doing. And I thought this speech by Larry Elder might give us a few points that we would be able to discuss here on this channel. Let me know if you're liking this content having to do with politics by giving me a thumbs up. I like to know that you are liking the content that I'm sharing. I received feedback on my last video and I'll link it in the description or somewhere above me um, w with that video if you haven't seen it. In the comments area of that video, I got some criticism, some feedback of some people feeling like that video was kind of just slanted towards one side, the conservative side rather than, you know, the Democrat side. And that I was talking about the talking points of Republicans. And then I also heard someone, well, I also read someone say that, you know, the politicians are never going to be the people that fix the problems of the world. That as Christians, we should be putting our faith in Christ. So to respond to people that felt that I didn't really represent their views and I wasn't being fair to the Democrats' views, Maybe you felt, hey, you're not really pointing out the hypocrisy on the other side. It wasn't really my desire to make anyone feel that way. I just didn't feel like it was relevant to share those things in, the, in that particular video. But in all fairness, I think this video would be a good opportunity to discuss some of those things as well. Later on, I do want to play a short clip of Larry Elder's um, the beginning of his speech and kind of share some of my own experiences and my own thoughts about what he's saying and why I hold to some of those political views personally. But first, I wanted to talk about, for example, the comment about like, should Christians really be vocal about politics and should we really try to change the world, our world? Um, by electing certain candidates, whether they're on the right or the left? Should we just kind of be apolitical? 
I think that's the proper way of saying it, where we don't really affiliate with either side because both sides are not perfect. Although we, as followers of Jesus, are occupied with the kingdom of God, our main mission and our main goal is to tell people about Jesus and to grow that kingdom, right? God is growing his kingdom through us. He uses us to communicate the message that he has given to us in his word. And so that is where our main focus needs to be. That said, however, we do live in this world and even Paul made some comments about how we are to interact with the political leaders that we are under their authority, their earthly authority here on earth. We're to pray for them and you know the goal being that we might enjoy quiet peaceful lives. I think if the goal is for us to be able to enjoy quiet peaceful lives then I think that means that we are not just to pray for our leaders in California specifically but in the United States we have the opportunity to vote for our leaders I am not too sure what the government situation looked like in Paul's days um, but as far as today goes we are able to voice our disagreements our disapproval we're able to vote against the leaders without any severe consequences and so in that way I mean if we had the right for example to vote for a dictator or um, for people that want to advance a government that takes away the freedoms that we have enjoyed and we do enjoy currently then our not getting involved in politics are not voting for certain leaders that will promote those liberties including the liberty of, of religious freedom of freedom of speech those are very important then we're not doing our part in experiencing that peaceful quiet life in as Paul was encouraging believers maybe that was the only thing that those believers could do so I would think that for us, our application of that lesson in the Bible would be that, okay, we can pray for our leaders and how often do we neglect doing that, you know? So we should be praying for our leaders, whether we agree with them or not, whether we like them or not, but also we should be voting, you know, if those leaders are not um, promoting a peaceful, quiet life for us are a threat even to our religious freedom and things like that then we should uh, get involved in as much as God has capacitated us in the place that we live in right so I do think that we should be more vocal as Christians about political issues we shouldn't accept that people should be free to do whatever they want whether it's like abortion because then people are not free to do whatever they want when it comes to like uh, stealing, when it comes to um, hurting people physically, um, when it comes to slandering. There are things that you can pursue justice in court because people are not free to do whatever they want. And so like this idea that Christians should just let people make their own decisions about certain things, well, to what extent are we talking about, you know? I think that we do have the ability to vote for leaders that will promote our beliefs. And this is why I don't believe that we're mixing um, the state and the church when we're voting with our Christian worldview and promoting our Christian worldview values. Because it's not like we are doing what used to happen even among Christians, you know, like if you didn't believe a certain type of view 
within Christianity, then like those people were killed, you know, and there was a lot of like persecution. And for us to jump to that conclusion that just because we are voting against, for example, abortion, that that is the same thing as like people dying long time ago because they differed on certain beliefs. I mean, that's a completely different situation. Same thing goes with eliminating the Christian worldview in schools because we're not eliminating all other worldviews that have remained in schools. So it's, it's like a misleading belief that we have that only Christianity is not allowed. But you see in our state standards, for example, in, in education, what teachers are to teach. California specifically is promoting like worldviews about same-sex marriage or things like that. Um, it's teaching about other religions, right? So why do we have to just give in to that idea that just Christianity is not allowed when it comes to voting and when it comes to education? It's it's the people that do not agree with the Christian worldview that are trying to, you know, advance their own worldview and and try to convince you that it's wrong for you to push your own worldview. So that was one of the things I wanted to talk about. The next thing is that we have gone so far away from being able to communicate with people that we disagree with in a healthy and productive manner. It has come down to just insults and manipulation and it affects our families, it affects our friends. You feel like you can't even put, for example, a sign, a political sign with your politician, the person that you want to vote for without feeling like people are going to label me as like an extremist and it's really sad. I want to promote on my channel that we as Christians and even non-Christians can learn to have good conversations, intelligent conversations, respectful conversations, tolerant conversations with people that disagree with us. And the purpose is to express our views and also to be educated about other people's views and mainly it's to engage in critical thinking to be able to compare for example two opposing views for us to really seek out what is true what is the most moral thing for us to do and for us to be able to make better decisions in life and to promote a healthier society something worthwhile to pass on to our children to our children's generation. And this is what I wanted to talk about having to do with the recall. It's so easy for, for example, Democrats to say it's the Republican recall because it's just motivated completely by Republicans trying to take away the Democrats, you know, governor, for example, or the Democrat policies. And I personally try not to attribute motive to other people. Even if I do kind of feel like I might sense some motivation and I do share those opinions sometimes, I try to catch myself when I'm doing that because at the end of the day, we don't see inside people's hearts, inside people's minds. And we can't definitively say for sure this is why people were running we don't know we don't know if there were some candidates that were just it was a power grab or if there were genuine people democrats included and all other kinds of political parties in, involved in this recall that genuinely just wanted to help california with the problems that we do have if we are democrats then we need to acknowledge that there are problems that Newsom is not the perfect governor 
and maybe also like why am i supporting newsom simply because i follow whatever president biden and vice president kamala or is it kamala um tell me to support tell me to do i just blindly follow them or is it because i'm just voting because of policy reasons i agree more with democrats agenda okay or is it that you were kind of manipulated into thinking that republicans are your enemy and that we have to stop them and the same thing goes with republicans well why did you vote right for what candidate what were your reasons um, are you a blind follower of Trump, for example? Are you just thinking that your enemies are the Democrats? Are you afraid of what's going to happen to the country? And I feel like we need to actually talk about the real reasons why we disagree about things. That's what we should really be talking about. We should be seeing and hearing more debates about these things. It would have been awesome to have heard Newsom debate, for example, Larry Elder about policies and allow people to have a more informed decision when it came to voting. So as soon as it was kind of obvious that Newsom had won with votes yesterday's um, election, then I went to Twitter and I just started seeing all of these things like, you know, crying, for example, the word crying. Um, just people looking for videos to make memes of Larry Elder, for example, crying that he lost. Uh, people just, um, I guess, even trending the word Trumpsters. And it's just unfortunate that this is the kind of discussions that we're having just name calling stereotyping making enemies spreading hatred i agree that there are some people that follow leaders political leaders blindly they follow their political party blindly they don't want to see anything wrong that they justify everything wrong that their leaders are doing and i agree there are some people that are on the right that are just making decisions like that but as far as like calling them trumpsters i just feel like even if i think that about them i'm not going to call them that why because i think that for example if you really think that people are ignorant then we should try to educate them and calling them names is not going to help educate them secondly i wouldn't want to call biden blind supporters a derogatory name and another reason is that i don't want to see more division in our country it would be great for us all to disagree obviously we're not going to agree with each other it would be great if we could all disagree agreeably or like larry elder said in his speech let's be gracious about our defeat <laughs> the message of this video ultimately comes down to this if you win be gracious. I think God wants us to be gracious winners. And if you lost, be gracious. Be gracious losers. <laughs> um, be gracious when you are defeated. There is some speculation going on about was this a corrupt election? And at the end of the day, it would be great for people to look into that and not just to say, Oh, it's just, you know, the thing to do on the right to claim that every election is corrupt. Well, what are you doing? Are you really dismissing like real cases where people reported some things that were not right? I feel like we should, whatever side we're on, we should agree that let's look into those things. Because if I win, if my, if my team wins, if my political leader wins, I want him or her to have won fairly. Yeah? So this whole thing about just kind of dismissing the other side's uh, claims, concerns, is so unhelpful. The whole thing with like concerns, for example, about vaccinations and things like that, it's so unhelpful to just dismiss people's concerns and to belittle them and to make the opposite side um, that is not doing what you want them to do, to just like make them enemies. 
it's just not helpful for our country and we need to learn to talk about these things in a respectful manner and you know the reason why it's the thing to do these days to spread hatred to create enemies because that wins elections what is more motivating than when you hate someone you want to go show up to the polls and vote against the person you hate or the people you hate right you want to win and unfortunately that's where we're at today and i want to suggest that as followers of jesus we are to love our enemies that means we are to love the people that vote in a way that we disagree with we are to love even the people that mock us people that disrespect us that are rude to us right and so we are supposed to be the light in this dark world so as we are talking about politics as we're talking about politicians we need to stay on the point and communicate in a respectful loving manner um, also that doesn't spread anxiety but that communicates you know the the real threats that may be associated with something but also anxiety is so used in politics as well so we are to promote this worldview that god is in control no matter which politician wins no matter how terrible the country looks in the future god is in control in whatever situation god has a plan a larger plan that what we may even be aware of so if there are certain situations where we're disappointed because we prayed you know it was so reflect refreshing to hear um, a pastor praying like for god to help you know larry elder to to win because it feels like there's potential for corruption in elections um it, that alone was so refreshing to me because i felt like good we're we're asking god for what we want but at the same time we're not looking for to larry elder or anyone else as being the solution to our problems here in california we are acknowledging that god is the only one that can really give us solutions and it could be through leaders politicians i don't know one way or another god is going to help us be the light in this dark world so i wanted to play a video of larry elder um, speech in the beginning of his speech he started by talking about education how he was able to um, help I guess um, his family members that are Democrats to vote more consistently with their beliefs and he was talking about he was influential in that way when it came to the topic of education and as soon as he mentioned the name of his opponent I believe he said you know Governor Newsom or he said something like you know our opponent people in the audience started booing and maybe saying other things and it's so kind of uncomfortable and refreshing all at the same time that he pretty much doesn't just go along with it kind of like we saw not kind of we saw this with trump he would say uh, their opponents names and the whole crowd would just boo right and he kind of just smiled and because it's almost like you want to please your supporters that is also effective right just letting people just boo at whatever they want uh, name calling disrespecting opponents that we i think we're so desperate to win as republicans that we chose to have a blind eye about how wrong that was and we wanted to defend his unbiblical behavior okay so larry on the other hand he tells his supporters um no let's let's be gracious in defeat so in other words don't don't boo our opponent there she is gloria romero gloria let me say something about gloria romero you know who gloria romero is gloria romero is a democrat i'm hoping a recovering democrat but we'll see she was the senate majority leader she crossed party lines. She's still a Democrat. Like my mother was still a Democrat. My brother was still a Democrat. I couldn't get them to change their party, but I got them to vote a lot more sensibly. Gloria crossed state 
party lines in supporting my candidacy because of the issue of school choice. Because of the issue of school choice. As you know, my opponent, Governor Gavin Newsom, come on, let's, let's, let's be gracious, let's be gracious in defeat. There's another part also later on, I'm not going to show that part, well maybe I will, where he's talking about violence and that one of the, I think it was like a Democrat politician was actually attacked and then he kind of just stops what he was saying and he's like, are you really like laughing about that? Crime up, crime up, 41% in LA and I'm talking about shootings, homicides. Under this governor, 20,000 convicted felons were released early. What could possibly go wrong? The other day, former, president, former Senator Barbara Boxer was mugged in Oakland. You're not cheering for Barbara Boxer being mugged, are you? This is a, this is a rough crowd. So it's like Larry is keeping things real and he's not afraid to call them out, the, his own supporters. And he's leading them. He's, he's being a leader about how you go about having these conversations about the people in the political world that we disagree with. He, so he goes into depth about education and how the way things are going in California are so against of us, of our children. They're not getting the best education possible because so many inadequate teachers are being protected by politicians. And those politicians are re reaping the rewards of supporting those people that protect those incompetent teachers. We may have lost the, the battle, but we are going to win the war. Gloria crossed party lines because of the issue of school choice. We're spending $15,000 every year for students in our government schools in California. Notice I don't call them public schools, I call them government schools. $15,000 a year, some of the worst reading, reading scores, some of the worst, worst math scores, only about 15 or 16 states spend more. And the students that are getting the raw end of the deal are the black and brown students who comprise 80% of the government students in our government schools. They're getting the worst teachers, the worst principals, the worst administrators, the worst outcomes. What is the route from poverty to middle class? At least finish high school. One presumably where you can read, write, and compute at grade level, and that is not happening. I read a study that said roughly 5% of government teachers across the nation are incompetent, roughly 5%. I have no idea whether that's true of California, but let's assume for a moment that it is. There are 300,000 public school teachers in California. Any given year, 2.2 are fired. If it is true that 5% are incompetent, that means 15,000 are incompetent. 2.2 every year are fired. Again, I'm not saying that applies to California, but assuming it does, imagine if that applied to cops in LA. I'm in LA, 10,000 force. So assuming 15% were incompetent. We're talking about 500. 500. Doing what? Planning evidence, engaging in racial profiling, using excessive force, we wouldn't put up with it. We'll put up with 15,000 incompetent public school teachers. That is why Gloria and I support school choice. So the money, so the money goes into an account, education savings account that the parent can control, put the kid in a charter school, a private school, a religious school, or God forbid, homeschooling. The reason we started this campaign is because this man, Governor Gavin Newsom, was sitting up there at the French Laundry restaurant with lobbyists who contributed to his campaign, 
with the people who drafted the mandates that they were violating by not wearing masks, by not engaging in social distancing, while telling you to do it. Meanwhile, his own kids were enjoying in-person private education. Now, he incurred a $12,000 wine tab. No, I don't know what they ordered, but I bet you it wasn't Mad Dog 2020. And now the reason why I wanted to talk about this in particular was that I want to show you that there are good reasons for why someone would be a Republican, for why someone would want to vote for Larry Elder as opposed to Gavin Newsom. I want to promote critical thinking when it comes to politics. So if you have your own differing views, make sure to leave those in the comments. So I remember being in certain classrooms, sometimes by mistake, and um, the teachers were just not adequate when it came to classroom management. And that's the first thing that you need to be good at when you go take these classes in a university to become a teacher. That's the thing they tell you, you need to be able to manage the classroom. And that was most of the problem in a lot of these classes teachers just gave up and they just like if there was like a behavior problem i remember math teacher it was like the last period right the last class of the day he was tired right and if there was that one loud annoying student in the back just being unruly like cracking jokes and he addressed it and he just couldn't handle the student oh well like i'm done you guys don't want to learn Worst of all, I have heard someone that I trust completely and has no ulterior motive to share this thing with me. That person has shared with me that there were high school teachers that just pretty much told them, you guys are never going to um, make it to college. You guys are never going to succeed in life. Okay, you have teachers in public schools that are doing this. And do students even feel able to go somewhere and like share this with, maybe they don't even share with their parents, but is there anybody that would be able to hold teachers accountable for these things? I remember teachers talking about like inappropriate things as well. That The person that I mentioned earlier, that person also shared with me that even in elementary, they did nothing. They just pretty much hung out. The teacher was sleeping. That person told their mother. The mother did not believe the child. And one day, the mother goes into the classroom and um, saw that it was true. They were just all over the place, just hanging out, okay? Talk about wasting a whole year of education. And then you wonder why they didn't like succeed later on in life. Okay. You have also, for example, when you leave, you know, you graduate and you think, yes, I learned, I graduated high school. Then you go to, for example, community college and you have to be tested so that you know where you're going to start. For example, mathematics. I remember I had a PE coach as my geometry teacher and his passion was obviously football. And so he would assign us things that you can just find the answer in the back of the book and that would be a passing grade. So obviously um, I had better math teachers when it came to algebra and the higher math, but because that I had that one year um, with a not so great teacher, I wasn't able to really understand like the higher math. and when I uh, entered community college, I, even though I knew a higher level of algebra, um, I had to start back at geometry in college. So I'm doing high school level math in college. I started behind other people. So that took some more time for me to finish college. and. The way the college professor taught us geometry was so easy. She used, you know, the manipulatives and all of that. And what a difference a teacher makes. 
So just because you have a high school diploma does not mean that when you、um, get into community college, you are going to be able to, you know, start from there, from、um, higher college courses. A often, a lot of these students like me who maybe didn't have the best teachers along the way, they impact our future, our kids' future. And it's not really that a child wasn't, or a student wasn't that smart or intelligent or capable or had potential or were gifted, but it's more of a reflection of the teacher and not meeting the student's needs. Another reason for why I do not agree with just how things are being run in California is when I was studying to become an elementary teacher. And I was taking my classes in Cal State Fullerton. I remember just being very discouraged at the time. I think Obama was the president around that time.、Um, I guess it was around the year two thousand and twelve. And I remember being told by the professors, telling us, "If you're going to want to teach, you're going to have to move out of state." You're going to have to be willing to travel, or you're going to have to be willing to teach the classes that teachers usually want to start teaching. And why is that? California needs so many more teachers, but for whatever political reasons, people that are passionate and educated, young, energetic, ready to start their careers, they do not have those opportunities here. In this state, in California, but there are opp opportunities for them in other states. That makes no sense, especially when the classrooms are so overcrowded. So there's something wrong there. I remember going to a classroom in an elementary to observe and help out as one of my class requirements.、And、I remember the lady, the teacher. She was about to retire. And she kind of whispered to me, "Hey, there's going to be an opening in this school when I retire." And she told me, like, in how many years? But it just seemed like, wow, this is <laughs> this is how difficult it is to find an opening in an elementary school. As a homeschooling mom, I know that there's a greater advantage to the teacher-student ratio, and that's why you will find a lot of teachers that have taught for many years. And when they have their own children, they decide to homeschool their own children because they know they've been in the environment, and they would rather teach their own children than put their kids in public school. And private school is so expensive, especially in California. And I'm not sure why there's such a problem with charter schools politically. When we see that homeschooling children benefit from participating in these type of schools, or children that are not、um, do not have a lot of privileges when it comes to where you live,、um, sc charter schools that focus on like the things that seem to set students behind in just public schools, these charter schools specialize in those things and. Can give those students special attention. So that's why I side with the Republicans, and、uh, you know the way they they understand how California can better the education part of our state. So pretty much that's what I wanted to talk about for this part of his speech. And one last thing that I forgot to mention. You know it's. Probably common right now on our social media.、Um, my husband showed me a video of a man getting into a car and just laughing, like one of those laughs that it's like you're making fun of someone. You're laughing at their face, and it had like some words saying like you thought that you know that Newsom wasn't going to win,、um, something like that. And you know, I get that. But at the same time, you might not realize how disrespectful you are being if that's your demeanor when you your politician wins an election. Let me just share with you my own experience here at home. Yesterday, my husband works 
long hours. It, his work is really complicated, so it yesterday demanded all of his attention. And for one, a reason that I won't disclose, he wasn't able to um, mail in his ballot like I was. And so he needed to go to our local poll area to vote. And so this is how his day looked like. He gets home from a long day of work and then, you know, he hurries up to eat. He hurries down to the poll um, place where he, the voting place, and um, because he wants to make it before eight o'clock. So he had like 15 minutes to make it to vote. He gets there. There's a huge line, long line. So how is he spending his free hours, his evening? He spent it waiting in line so that he can vote for this recall. And he, while he's there, the TV news channels are already reporting, hey, Newsom won. And I have to say, I don't know why we're okay with that happening if we're really about every vote matters and every vote counts because how discouraging is it for all of those people who were voting for someone other than Newsom or even the people voting for Newsom they've been waiting all that time and for someone to just say we have a winner your vote is not necessary go home pretty much where we do have this law in place that if you make it to that poll place before eight o'clock, you can vote. You can still, if you made it to the line, you get to vote. And, you know, he texted me, asked me like, well, you know, what's the update? And I told him what the news were saying, but he's still waiting in line to vote. He gets home like two hours later, um, so like around 10, and like the results are in and all because he wanted to do his duty as an American citizen, as a person that lives in California, he wanted to vote. He wanted to voice his views. And when someone just mocks people because their candidate didn't win, or even if your candidate did win, it's like you're taking it so light. You're not really thinking things through. You're not respecting what everyone's day looked like. You're not respecting the American process. You're not respecting the voting process. You know, we all have this right to vote. And we should respect that we have this right in our country. And that we are all able to vote however we want. So making fun of each other, it seems very uneducated, unfortunately. And I'm not saying to go and tell people like how uneducated of you to, to you know, not be respectful or whatever. But I think it's just, I personally want to be mindful if, for example, in the next election, the Democrats were to lose. I want to be mindful as a Republican that I'm not going to I'm not going to be disrespectful to the Democrats. I'm not going to flaunt it, you know? I'm not gonna put it over them. Like I'm not going to belittle them. I'm going to act like what a grown up should act like. And in Larry Elder's words, be gracious. So those are my thoughts. As always, let me know what you think share with me your perspective you never have to agree with me you can disagree with me and let me know about it we can learn from each other if you enjoyed this video and you like this kind of content please remember to like subscribe if you haven't already and share this video with someone you know mm -hmm.